Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video, we're going to be discussing Bohr's model of the atom. So, so far, we've traced the development of ideas from Democritus to Dalton to Thomson and then to Rutherford. And now we take it one step further down to Danish physicist Niels Bohr thinking around about the time of, say, around about 1913, just before the outbreak of World War I. Okay, at a time of amazing development of ideas in physics and uh, the study of the atom and the nature of the inside of the atom. Okay, so we, um, look, looking at, the, the, at Rutherford's model of the atom, okay, so we have our, in Rutherford's model of the atom, we have a positively charged nucleus surrounded by electrons that orbit around the outside. So if each of these black dots is, represents an electron, this bit in the middle here is the nucleus, and these are our electrons um, orbiting. Okay, so this is what he proposed, that the nucleus was positively charged, and it had uh, most of the mass of the atom contained in the nucleus, that a tiny, tiny fraction of the mass was represented by the electrons, that the must have been because they were particles, but yet most of it was actually concentrated at this little area at the centre. Um, you know, his gold foil experiment and kind of identifying that, that those positive alpha particles could be repelled by the nucleus, but only one in every, you know, 10,000 times that it might happen. But then <clears throat> we come to Bohr, so a close um, colleague of Rutherford at around about the same sort of time, not long after Rutherford had proposed his idea, because this was Rutherford was around about 1911, so only a sh very short time later in scientific terms. Um, and so what, what Rutherford, um, sorry, what Bohr then, then kind of identified as a problem was that within that model of the atom, that then he couldn't explain... Um, coloured light. Okay, so that we've identified that we've done an activity where we set up a Bunsen burner and then we sprayed a solution through that flame from a spray bottle. Okay, let's see if I can represent the spray bottle in a semi-competent fashion. There we go. And then what we saw was coloured light being given off. Okay, and then what you identified, there were two things, that A, it was coloured, and B, that those colours were different for different elements, but they're consistent for that particular element. Okay, so that sodium, um, and sodium will always give off the same type of light, potassium will always give off the same type of light, okay, and so on. And what Bohr kind of encountered this idea, of, okay, well, how could it possibly, how could we possibly explain this phenomenon? with Rutherford's model of the atom, because there, there, was no, there, there was no way to make sense of it all, okay? And, um, and likewise, if we, if we haven't taken another look at, at Rutherford's kind of model of the atom, and just kind of look at more like a, like a top-down kind of view, kind of thinking about the electron and its orbiting around the outside, what, um, what Bohr kind of proposed, or recognising this idea, okay, well, because this is giving off energy, as it goes around, it should actually spiral its way because it's attracted to the nu it's an opposite charge to the nucleus, so it should be attracted towards the centre and then <laughs> as it kind of collapse into the nucleus in a massive kind of burst of energy because the the atom should you know it should be spiralling down and then uh, being attracted to the nucleus and then it 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 um being unstable this way and yet recognizing that it didn't do that. And again, trying to trying to ex explain that. So Bohr then made us a slight tweak to Rutherford's model of the atom, and then he proposed um, the existence of electron um, shells or energy shell energy shells. Okay, so that then if we look at our atom, the positively charged nucleus in the middle, and then proposing that, okay, that around the outside of that atom, that there exists a, a series of kind of layers or spaces where electrons can be found. Okay, and so then we place electrons in them until they are full, 
and then we start filling up extra shells and so on. So that rather than them all kind of orbiting in the nucleus in the same kind of way, that then actually recognizing that they orbit in a particular place that's fairly fixed, okay, that recognizing then that the electrons tend to be found in, in that particular place. We'd start from low energy and moving up to high energy. As you get close, as we start from close to the nucleus and progress further away. Okay, so sometimes, as you can imagine, if you if you can kind of use a bit of imagination in looking at this, that we would refer to this as the solar system model. Okay, because it's not hard to see the comparison that the sun at the centre and then planets orbiting around it at a particular distance away from the sun. You know, Mercury and then Venus, Earth, Mars, so on. Okay, that those orbits getting further away. Um, now, the way that he then tried to make sense of the fact that coloured light could be given off is that he then proposed that electrons can jump between shells. Okay, so electrons can jump between shells. So if we imagine, say, looking at this electron here, but then this electron can be made to jump into the next shell. Okay, now the way that it could make sense that, that this could work is that it absorbs energy somehow. And so it absorbs energy, jumps up, and then what we talk about is it reaches what's called an excited state. Okay, so it starts off down low, it absorbs energy, and it goes up to this higher, unstable, excited state. And then it, but it can't remain in this excited state for very long, so it drops back down, and then what it does is it then releases energy in the form of coloured light. Okay, so if we're kind of looking at our model here, that we're seeing that the electron has jumped up to here by absorbing energy, but it's unstable and it can't stay there. And so what it then does is then it drops back down to its previous place. And what it does is then it gives off coloured light. And that the colour relates to energy. Um, the energy absorbed. Okay, so that the bigger the, the jump that it has to make, the um, the bigger the amount of energy that's involved to make that happen. Okay, um, I'm just gonna uh, I'll clean off this little bit over on the side over here, and I'll, I'll kind of introduce a little, little bit of an analogy that might help there. <clears throat> okay, so if we imagine an electron down the bottom here of a series of steps. Okay, and so that we can see that we can make, you know, just thinking about you jumping up steps as well. So if, um, if we had an electron and then we want to make it jump up to a higher step, energy it has to be absorbed. Okay, in order to do that, or energy is involved in making that, that jump to a higher level. Okay, but being on a higher level is more dangerous, it's more unstable. And so then what the tendency would be it is to drop back down. Okay, so if I take that. And then what that does is that rather than energy being absorbed here, we say energy is being released. Or the other word that's a little bit more scientific that we would use is the energy has been emitted. It's been given out, emitted. And so what that does is that then that gives off coloured light. But what we can see is that then if I take this same electron, I can make it jump up to a higher level, or I can make it jump up to an even higher level. And then what happens is that then we see that the energy difference from that step to the bottom step is different, okay? And then what that mean, what that ends up meaning is that the bigger the jump that we make, the more that's energy that's involved, the different colour that we get of light when it drops back down, okay? So more energy equals different colour. Okay, and we as, as scientists can actually predict what type of colour that it's going to make. Um, th th there is more of a pattern that the higher the energy, the more blue that light becomes.
okay, or more, you know, heading more towards the blue end of, of the electromagnetic spectrum, which we'll learn about um, a little bit later on. Okay, so Bohr's model of the atom then proposed that electrons exist in um, energy shells or electron shells, um, that they, that have kind of a, they're sort of a fixed kind of way away from the nucleus, which is at the center, and that also that then electrons are able to jump between one shell to the next shell by absorbing energy, which is unstable, and so then they tend to release energy to drop back down. They release that energy in the form of colored light, and that the amount of energy that was given off is relates to the color that, of light that ends up being given off. And that what we see is that then, because the, the electrons in um, each atom are different, that then the amount of energy that's involved in making those jumps is a bit different, which is why elements give off different colors of light to one another. Okay? Um, so it helps to explain or, or kind of make sense of some of the things that Rutherford's model couldn't um, with a little bit of an extra tweak. Now, one last bit of information, because I know we're getting towards the end, um, that this idea of what's called the fixed capacity. So fixed capacity, that is that the electron shells don't have an infinite kind of space. That then that we it's given by what's called a rule called 2n squared. So if n equals the, sh the number of the shell, okay, that the number of electrons is given by 2 times the number of the shell squared. So if n equals 1, the electrons equals 2. If n equals 2, the electrons equals 8. 2 times uh, 2 squared, which is 4, 2 times 4 is 8. When n equals 3, the electrons equals 18. Okay, n equals 4, electrons equals 32. So what we see as we get further and further on, we add more and more shells, that then we can fit more and more electrons in them. Okay, one way that you can picture it would be like um, seating at a, at a concert, you know, thinking about like an Adele concert, for example. Okay, or, so, or somewhere where, you know, the, the act is kind of in the middle, that there's only a limited amount of seating very close by, but the further away that you get, the more seats that can be, um, can be used as you get further and further away. Okay, and so there's more people that can sit in them, more, more um, that can fill them up. Okay, so we've traced, uh, over the last few videos, we've traced um, the development of ideas all the way up to Bohr. We've seen the improvements that Bohr's model made over Rutherford's model by introducing the concept of electron shells. We've seen that electrons can jump between shells and that shells have a fixed capacity given by this maths formula of 2n squared. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.